Hello, my name is Benjamin Hart. I'm an American attorney and the managing director of Integrity Legal here in Bangkok, Thailand. Question posed in this video is why do I care so much about this so-called digital wallet scheme? And again, this is an opinion piece, as you'll note in the, in the thumbnail. So this is just one man's opinion. So take it or leave it. But I, you know, the reason I care so much about this is because Quite honestly, this is full-blown communism. That's really the only word for it. I believe it was Stalin who once said that communism is socialism in a hurry. I've often quipped that Keynesianism is socialism by subterfuge. Well, this thing is communism by subterfuge on steroids, quite honestly. That's, that's really, there's really no other word for it. And when people ask me that, they say, well, it doesn't apply to everybody. Well, okay, well, first, so it only applies to the people who take the money, which are obviously going to be the people who are at the lower end of the economic strata. So we'll only insert them in some kind of future communist dystopia. But beyond even that, it's not. It's not actually that. And I've noticed there's been a lot of mitigating action, if you will, taken by those who seem to be pushing this. I find it also interesting, this has a lot to do with Quite honestly, the World Economic Forum's agenda and all these agendas of these internationalists or globalists, whatever you want to call them, who don't seem to give much of a care in the world about how this would impact the vast majority of people and their freedoms and liberties as just people walking around. Because it will have tremendous implications, as we'll get into later in this video. But long story short, the other reason I'm so concerned is that it will have an impact across the board. There is no strata of the economy that will not be impacted by this. And what I find rather ironic is the upper end of the social strata, especially so-called celebrities and things, they don't necessarily care so much about privacy because for most of their careers, they haven't really had it. And, you know, and that, that, that's can be said for a lot of public figures out there. But at the end of the day, for the vast majority of people, having privacy, basic privacy, in even just minor transactions, that's a right. That's a human right. People, you know, people have the right to not have oversight associated with their basic economic needs, to say the least, let alone the fact that, quite honestly, they have, people have a right to privacy in all, in my opinion, their economic transactions. And so as one of the first citations we're going to put up here regarding this whole thing, I'm thinking of a quote, and I'm paraphrasing it, and I'm probably butchering it from Donald Sutherland in the movie Citizen X, where he said a good bureau, and this is set in the USSR. This is set in late Soviet era Russia, where he said, you know, the measure of a good bureaucracy is that it gives special consideration to no one. And that's what I see coming with this as we'll get into later that said, I thought of making this video after reading a recent article, uh, actually a number of recent articles, hats off to the Bangkok Post very much so for staying on top of this whole issue. But I thought, of, uh, I thought of making this article after reading a recent article from the Bangkok Post, bangkokpost.com. Article is titled, Union Urges Bank to Come Clean Over Digit Digital Wallet Financing Role. Then in there, there's a quotation from the former Prime Minister here in Thailand, quoting directly, former Prime Minister Thaksin Shinawat on Saturday expressed confidence in the government's 500 billion baht handout. Bear this in mind, again, it's a 500 billion, half a trillion baht handout, which first of all, let's just talk Keynesianism for a moment. What is Keynesianism? Well, Keynes came up with this idea at its, its most basic. It is when there's a government, like, excuse me, when there's an economic downturn the government steps in and spends money to quote unquote stimulate the economy. And then when there's an upswing, basically taxes to make up for what they spent and reaches a kind of equilibrium. It's one of these theories that makes great sense on paper, but honestly as a practical matter doesn't really work. And as I said earlier, I've quipped before where Joe Stalin once said, communism is socialism in a hurry, Keynesianism is socialism by subterfuge. I remember in the 90s, growing up in America, it was anathema that the government would even think of getting involved in the economy. And then slowly but surely, with these Keynesian notions, we ended up with massive government intervention in the economy to the point now 
where quite honestly, the, the United States particularly, but the rest of the West, I mean, Europe as well, some of the Anglosphere has serious problems with debt to GDP ratio issues, ongoing debt issues, debt financing issues, because of too much central planning intervention. That's what it comes down to, is a small group of people think they can coordinate the economy in any way. And we have, the 20th century, if nothing else, proved this was not possible. Now, it's possible to manipulate it for a short period of time, but the ramifications are dire. And we've seen the ramifications long term. I grew up, I left the United States at a time when I saw them overly intervening some 15 years ago, and I could see what was coming. And we're here now, basically, because there's been too much intervention. And it's unnecessary. And quite honestly, it goes against basic notions of free markets. And I didn't use the term capitalism because let's be clear, there's a very big difference between free enterprise and capitalism. Capitalism, interestingly enough, Das Kapital was a book written by Karl Marx because it's the other side of the coin of communism in a Hegelian dialectic between those two systems. At the end of the day, the synthesis of which, or the extremes of either end of that dialectic, end up in the same place, which is a small group of people in the capitalist system, you call them interlocking directorships, in the communist system, you just call them commissars, a small group of people directing the economy. And it doesn't work out well. Even, in, even the synthesis of it doesn't work out very well. Free enterprise must prevail. If you want a strong economy, it's free enterprise that keeps it going. As I've discussed in other videos, it was the informal economy that ultimately, it took years, but it was the informal economy that saved Thailand financially. At the end of the day, it was the informal economy. As much as I've read some articles recently, like vitriolic articles from bankers saying, we got to get this informal economy just under control and get it. No, we don't. We don't. You know, people, you know, Thailand is for the Thais. It's, it's about freedom. People need to be able to operate freely within a free enterprise system. Obviously, there are regulations that are needed, you know, to live in a lawful society. I'm not saying that. But again, this government intervention is what is causing the problems. And I'll get further into that quoting further. During his visit to his home province of Chiang Mai for the Songkran Festival, quoting further, he brushed aside criticism and said the country's economy remained sluggish, but was expected to, to improve after the digital dollar wallet rollout. Two things. First of all, the economy is sluggish because the economy was shut down by central planners for years. That's why the economy is sluggish. Okay? Secondly, explain to me how a digital wallet rollout will improve anything if it doesn't create any new value. All it is is it, it's, it's a redistribution of chits and moves pre-existing goods and services around creating taxable events that doesn't actually create any new value. So the underlying real economy, how does it improve in that scenario? Quoting directly, our country's growth is slower than that in other ASEAN countries because there isn't enough money in the system. Okay, this is one of these Keynesian arguments, and I heard this. It's this whole liquidity argument that you'll hear about. Let me, let me quote again. Our country's growth is slower than that in other ASEAN countries because there isn't enough money in the system. First off, again, no, it's because the, the economy was fully shut down for years and it takes a minute, you don't just flip a switch and it turns back on. That was the silliness that got us into that, that kind of thinking. And I'm, and I'm not blaming the Thai system entirely for that. Governments around the world, including the United States, they did this as well. And it was, it was foolish there too, in my opinion. The, so that's the first thing. Also, other ASEAN countries, because there isn't enough money in the system? No, Thailand looks relatively sluggish compared to their growth in terms of GDP, which is merely a metric of bank credit, because other nations are engaging in infrastructure projects more basic than Thailand's, because Thailand's economy is more developed and more sophisticated. They're not, Thailand isn't building 
highways for the first time. Thailand isn't building railroads for the first time or telephone lines or telecommunications lines. Thailand has all that infrastructure already. So when a less developed country, say Indonesia, for example, makes a capital improvement, their GDP goes up substantially, but Thailand's looks like it's slower. Well, you know, yeah, when you're starting from zero, there's nowhere to go but up. When you're already at 89 and you go up to 90, relative to going from zero to 50, it looks, you know, it looks substantially different. But at the end of the day, it's indicative of the fact that Thailand already has a developed economy. Quoting further, the government seeks to inject money to stimulate it, unquote. How does that work? Because the West is the best example right now of how printing money and just shooting it into the system does not help with the fundamentals. If anything, it actually makes the populations of those societies more complacent to the underlying fundamental problems within the real economy and thereby not address them. Quoting further, Paxson said the sluggish economy was due to delayed approval of the annual budget and bureaucratic changes that hindered swift implementation. So the lack of government intervention in a free market economy, that's the problem? Again, I, I fail to see where this verbiage is getting all that different from communistic types of discussion. Okay, so that said, leaving that and moving over here to, again, Bangkok Post, bangkokpost.com. Article is titled, PM Sata uh, uh, reiterates faith in the wallet handout scheme. Quoting directly, he said the terms and conditions for spending the handout were different from those of previous handout schemes, including those implemented during the COVID-19 pandemic. Recipients of the digital wallet scheme are required to spend the money in their localities, which is intended to stimulate the sluggish economy in the provinces. A couple of interesting things here. First of all, the government goes into debt, which the people are going to eventually have to repay in the form of their taxes, but the government gets to tell you where you spend your own money effectively. Okay? And for those that think I'm overreacting to this, I'm going to put up a clip. This actually comes from the Twitter account of Mr. Jim Rickards, James G. Rickards. And I'll put this up on screen, his actual Twitter quote. I wrote years ago this was coming. Here it is. And then a subtweet that he's retweeting under Crypto T. Bank in Canada won't let customer withdraw cash. They ask him to prove why he needs cash. And then we're going to go ahead and play that clip here. I can't. Well, wait, I don't understand. What are you talking about? So I will either give you a bank truck or if you're going to get cash, I will need an invoice for the car purchase. Why? No, I'd like to. It's for it, the car's payments for in cash. I, I can't. I can't use a bank draft. Are you buying from like a private? Yeah, it's private. Person? It's literally from my friend. From your friend? Yeah, but he wants it in cash. Can he give you like anything that you're purchasing from him? No, I don't. You don't need that, I, bro. What is it? I'm only asking for three. What? What is this? I, I, it's my money. I'm allowed to withdraw from my own bank account. You said that. What's the maximum limit you can give a withdrawal to a customer? It's three thousand dollars on the date. You've already mentioned that multiple times. Yeah, not today. Why not today? Today I would need a bank draft or we get an invoice. But why? You don't. So you need proof of what it is. Why is that? And why is that? Why is that? Why do you need? Why do you need me to tell you what it is? Why do you need? What kind of proof is that? I bring in a note. Like, what? How is that? What is that going to change? I don't understand. So that you, you need to give my money. I'm not taking a bank job. I would like cash, please. Yeah, I won't give you I'm just going to sit here until you give me cash. So I'm not going to leave. Okay. You want to have a sit there? And then do what? What? Who am I waiting for? I can get the manager to talk to you. Well, yeah, get the manager because this is like, it's unbelievable. Now, bear in mind, this is in the West. Okay. And it's Canada, which, I don't know, has become some sort of dystopian neo-Marxist hellscape, for lack of a better term. And no offense to Canadians, but I don't think a lot of you would disagree at this point. The, but the, again, imagine how, e like, if you watch this video and you see that he's actually, this person is able to physically talk to people and say, what are you talking about? I want my own money out of the bank. Why do you need to know why I'm doing anything with it? Imagine what it's going to be like if it's digital. 
where all you get is just a screen that pops back to you that says, oh, you can't do that. For whatever reason, the product you're buying, we don't think it's the good time of day to buy it. We don't think you're in the right place to buy it. How many iterations of, quite honestly, tyranny can be rolled out with a digital system like that? Again, and who do you call? Anybody that's used a lot of these new websites now or haven't been directed to a web portal rather than a real person to deal with matters, you, you know. Do you deal with this? Is it easy? No, it's harder in most cases. I made videos about that, talking about the immigration system, most notably the U.S. immigration system, where in the past, you know, if I had a real problem with U.S. immigration, I'd get on the phone. Yes, I'd be on the phone for a while on hold, and then you get somebody and you talk to them. Now you get the runaround if you try to call anybody and they just redirect you to an online system or send you to an AI portal, and all it does is just spins its wheels if the system doesn't want you to do what you're trying to do. And that's what it comes down to. Well, imagine that scenario, only again, it's your money. And this is not far off. This is not some pie in the sky notion. Again, that clip was just put out. That's real. That's happening in real time now. Again, imagine what will happen if there is a digital mechanism for accomplishing that. Okay, meanwhile, I'm going to move over to the print edition of the Bangkok Post here real quick. I'm going to put this up on screen. Title is Digital Wallet Super App to Link with Bank Apps. So for those who think, oh, okay, the banking system in Canada, that's a different thing than the banking system in here in Thailand. Well, no, they're linking them together. Quoting directly, the so-called super app earmarked for the 10,000 baht digital wallet scheme will work in sync with existing mobile applications for banks on users' phones. According to Deputy Finance Minister Julapon Amun Wiwat. So, yeah, this has a banking aspect to it. Going back to, again, that article titled, PM Sreta reiterates faith in wallet handout scheme, quoting directly, Economist Anusorn Tamjai on Monday issued a five-point caution to the government regarding the plan to borrow from the BAAC, and apparently that's the Agricultural Bank, and there's some kind of complex scheme for funding this because they're saying, well, we're not using debt, which I'll get into that in a minute. We're not using it the way that you think we're using it. My personal opinion, a bunch of smoke and mirrors, and I'll get into why here in a minute. But the, that's the background, that's the BAAC. And I urge those who are watching this video, go check out all these articles in detail. You can read the details of this and gain your own insight into it. Quoting further, among them is that the government should devise a repayment and compensation plan in which 40 to 50 billion bots should be allocated to the BAAC per year to prevent potential financial issues affecting the bank. Well, again, I thought this wasn't coming out of debt at all. You know, I thought it came out of the budget, money already collected. Quoting further, and here's, here's a real zinger. The borrowed amount is initially classified as, quote, off-budget, unquote, and not immediate public debt. I state that again. The borrowed amount is initially classified as off-budget and not immediate public debt. So there's a, there's a great book out there. It's called The Smartest Guys in the Room. And it's a book about the Enron Corporation, which went bust back in about, I think it was 2006, 2007, maybe a little bit earlier than that, 2005, maybe. Yeah, I was in law school when all this happened. In fact, we studied the Sarbanes-Oxley Act quite a bit because it was a response to what had happened under Enron. One of the things Enron was known to do, it's one of these pieces of accounting and financial chicanery, was to create special purpose vehicles to create off balance sheet places where Enron could put substantial amounts of debt that it didn't want its shareholders and auditors to see. And at the time it was sort of gray area legal and if you recall, Arthur Anderson ended up exploding over the whole thing because they signed off on some things basically that they shouldn't have in terms of the legality of the whole thing. But long story short is this was, this was a known practice at the time. These special purpose vehicles that allowed for off balance sheet debt holding that then the underlying shareholders or anyone else concerned with the financial health of that company couldn't see. Quoting further, however, the borrowed amount 
could become public debt if future revenue cannot be raised to cover it, he said. I state that again. Let me quote that again. Put that on screen again. However, the borrowed debt could become public debt if future revenue cannot be raised to cover it, he said. Well, a couple of things here. As noted, this stimulus doesn't create any new value in the economy. It creates new taxable events, which they can then tax people on or corporations or whatever. So some revenue will come out of that, but no underlying value. Okay? So... And then on top of it, they're all at the same time saying, well, the, the economy is so sluggish. It's so sluggish that we need to do this. But we're not going to do it until the fourth quarter of the year, which takes us over into a new fiscal year, it's my understanding. And then, or at least partially into a new fiscal year when we come back to relook at this. When we do that, is there going to be enough revenue or are they just going to call it public debt then? You see what I'm saying? They're deferring the labeling of it as debt using what it basically amounts to something akin to what in the smartest guys in the room book said special purpose vehicle to take it off calling it debt today but if we don't do this that and the other thing which we probably won't do anyway and they're even saying that well the economy is sluggish this is why we have to do this so it seems logical to infer it's possible that it could happen that we won't have the revenue and therefore have to classify this as debt later Quoting further, quote, as the borrowed amount is initially classified as, quote, off budget and not immediately public debt, the, em the estimated public debt could be lower than it is. Now, that is about as much of a definition of technocratic economic gobbledygook as I've ever heard. So it's debt, unless it's not debt, unless we say it's debt, and it could be debt, but it's not debt. It is today, it's gone tomorrow. It's a whozy, it's a whatsy, it's a fugazi, it's a this, it's a that. Come on. Come on. At the end of the day, you're trying to use debt to create an infrastructure that would cast a huge net of surveillance on every single tie for any transaction possibly in the future that they would undertake because apparently they're tying this into the banking system. And this is not pie in the sky talk. This is not some kind of chimeric problem in the future. This is already happening in other jurisdictions where we can see it. And those jurisdictions are dealing with cash. We're not even talking about having a digital system where, again, you won't even talk to a person. They'll just say, well, you can't have your cash for that purpose. Can't use your digital tokens for that purpose. Again, my problems with this don't, again, it, I, I was listening to, I believe it's uh, Dave Collum the other day, and I'll put up a I'll put up a link in the description below to his Twitter. He's got a lot, he does a lot of YouTube as well, where he was talking about how Matt Taibbi got into all the chicanery that went down in the last financial crisis in the United States. And it, it was only when Taibbi heard that it's not a financial problem, it's a crime problem that is paradigm shifted. I'm not saying there's any crime going on here, but this is not a financial issue to my mind. This is a Marxism issue. Quite honestly, I know I'm getting a little sweaty on this on this video. It's hot in this room, but I want to get this thing done and out. So to my mind, you know, I, and I don't necessarily think any of the folks that are trying to go for this are like Marxists or anything. And they just I just think that this is a lot of technological smoke and mirrors. I think people can act in good faith and say, oh, hey, we don't actually have to print money. We can we can create stimulus in the economy and then and then just do it all digitally. I think people are actually acting in good faith, but I don't think they are really looking at the ramifications of this, and I don't think they understand that the places where these plans and schemes are promulgated do not have the best intentions of the populations of the world at heart. I definitely don't think they care at all about the population of Thailand, these internationalists, these globalists. At the end of the day, I just think they like control or whatever. But long story short, Again, I don't think any of the local people here. I just, think, I just think it's one of those things that sounds like a good idea, and then you dig into it just a little bit, not unlike communism for that matter, or Marxism, where you, you know each according to his ability, each according to his needs. Oh, that sounds really nice until you dig in to the implementation of it, and it's horrible. You know, it's basically the horrific history of the 20th century. Long story short, and again, before I melt like a snow cone in Phoenix, the point I'm trying to make here Again, this is not a finance issue. This is not a liquidity issue fundamentally. And secondly, 
If nothing else, the past 15 years has proven that this whole, oh, let's just inject liquidity and that, that'll solve all problems. It doesn't. It's been proven that it doesn't. You can look over at the West and just see that that is the case. It's self-evident at this point. Okay? The point I'm trying to make, though, is the other side of the coin is also, it, it's basically totalitarian surveillance. And it's us ties that would, in the end, be the ones paying for it. 